Kia ora and good morning. Welcome to the next in our series. Spark Lab and the future of the future have always had their eyes set on the horizon. The emerging trends, the insights, the innovation, ideas from tomorrow to help business leaders perform better today. But what I don't think any of us could have foreseen is just how quickly that future would arrive. Cue COVID-19, and hence the reason this morning we have our speaker in downtown San Francisco, while close to a thousand of us are assembled virtually, something we've all become quite accustomed to, to this time listen, to share our ideas, to ask our questions. And despite all that change, three things remain the same. The first is the ambition of this series. Spark Lab and Future of the Future is designed to give businesses and business leaders a fast-paced, high-impact briefing to the future of business, designed so they can help them and their business the very same day. The second is the format. This will work again this morning with a talk and then your opportunity to ask any question you might have through the button that's the bottom of the app. And the third is the calibre of our speakers. Spark Lab and Future of the Future scour the earth to find the thought leaders, the innovative, the outspoken, those not afraid to speak up and to stand out. That's the reason that this morning we have Ethan. Ethan's career includes an illustrious list of some of the world's most progressive and most innovative organizations. From Adobe to Google, Airbnb to Uber, to now his current role as VP at Slack. And you'll be aware Slack is an enterprise tool for humans. Its ambition is to encourage transparency, collaboration, and democratization in the way we communicate. And arguably, could there be a better time than to encourage collaboration and transparency in the way that we communicate? Today's talk, you'll hear Ethan's insights into the evolution of change in technology and get an understanding on how, how his personal hobbies for the likes of beekeeping and pottery throwing inspire and help him determine the way that as an organization, organizations around the world will communicate in a better way. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Ethan Eisman. Thanks, Simon. Hello, everyone. I'm Ethan Eisman, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. My presentation focuses on three things. First, how humans and our tools have influenced each other over history, and how this relates to the evolution of technology. This will help set the stage for the second part of the presentation. We'll use the lessons that we learned in the first part to shine a light on the radical changes to the way that we work, accelerated by our global response to COVID. We'll specifically focus on how our digital tools enable us to effectively work remotely, replacing the traditional physical walls of our offices. Lastly, we'll wrap up with a few provocative questions that explore how we might continue to adapt our tools and the ways that we use them to enable a new and hopefully better way of working. But before we start, I'd like to provide a quick bit of information about me that lends context to this talk. Why am I interested in tools and technology? how people use them and their impact on different realms of society. Well, it all started in college where I studied philosophy and ceramics. This was in the late 1990s and the internet and personal computers were starting to become more mainstream. As a ceramicist, I prized the act of working with my hands, my eyes, my sense of balance and my human instinct. Thinking critically about technology, I recognize that as computers become increasingly ubiquitous, they seductively reduce our needs as humans to exercise our bodies and our senses. Indeed, much of the work of computers relies on the sitting still, often hunched over, typing on a keyboard, moving a mouse, or tapping a screen. Just those three methods of input results in a world of possibilities. The computer gives us superpowers. We can communicate and connect with anyone in the world. We can create in new and in wonderful ways. Computers make it just infinitely easier for us to do things that used to require significant time and energy. But at the same time, technology creates a literal divide between our natural world, the world of nature and our five senses, and the digital world, the world of bits and bytes. This tension between the feeling of doing ceramics, working with dirt, water, and fire, and the power of technology led me to a career designing for positive interactions between computers, humans, and society. This journey started out designing at Adobe Systems, where I led design for the Creative Cloud, Fireworks, Flash, and Photoshop. These are all tools that are designed to help people express themselves creatively. I spent a good 10 years of my life at Adobe, observing how humans interface with computers, 
to illustrate, edit photos, make videos and animations, lay out books and other printed material, and design apps and software. Interestingly, or sadly, the modes of interaction between humans and digital creative tools hasn't changed much over the past 30 years. Behold, the Illustrator toolbar from 1987 to 2017. There is an evolution here, but it's not radical. It's the same fundamental interaction pattern. Click an icon in the toolbar, get a new tool cursor, click the canvas, do something with the tool over and over and over again. In any case, this simplified workflow has taken the place of people mixing paint in a palette, graphic designers painting their type, the actual physical act of printing, the texture of paper. This isn't to say that our digital tools are necessarily bad because they replace our physical analogs, but instead they engage our five senses in a different way and in a way that doesn't necessarily complement them. So on the one hand, our creative tools make it easier for people to be creative and express themselves in relatively sophisticated and complex ways. But on the other hand, they pull us away from those things that make us, make us actually human, our five senses and our multimodal way of connecting with the world. After my 10 year stint at Adobe, I journeyed to Google. I joined Google because I was interested in working at the company that defined technical innovation. After all, Google as a tool has had more impact on the world than almost any other tool by providing universal access to information about the world to people relatively free of charge, other than the cost of your attention and personal data, which is monetized to facilitate their advertising machine, which is also a very interesting tool. In any case, Google's impact on society is massive. In 2018, people made 63,000 searches per second on any given day. That translates into at least 2 trillion searches per year. All that information accessed by billions of people who can then use it to learn, grow, and make better decisions. In terms of impact on society as a tool, Google is beyond compare. At Google, I spent four years and about a half designing for their commercial products, travel, shopping, and payments. Most of the work my teams did at Google focused on providing people the right information at the right time to help them make decisions about how to spend or save money. I next joined Uber where I led their global design team. Uber is an entirely different type of tool. It's one that facilitates the movement of people and goods across the world. Uber has also made a massive impact on society, cities, economies, and regulations. You know, Uber was one of those companies that prided itself in its ability to disrupt the status quo. They disrupted the global taxi industry. Cities have remodeled their streets in order to accommodate for ride sharing. And food delivery has made it possible for many restaurants to stay in business during this uh, lockdown. Next, I moved to Airbnb, where I led their design team that focused on home sharing. Airbnb's mission is to help people across the world belong anywhere. And they wanted to meet this mission by making it easy for anybody to rent out spaces in their home uh, to strangers. Airbnb used technology to create a tool that allowed hosts to list their home and guests to book their home. This created a two-sided marketplace whose primary purpose is to connect people and facilitate learning about the world. Interestingly, of all the companies I've worked with, Airbnb is the one that is most specifically focused on leveraging technology to further enhance deep human connection. Why? Well, because Airbnb is focused on hospitality and hospitality as a practice is very difficult to replicate or automate with software technology. It's really about humans coming together. After two good years at Airbnb, I joined Slack. I made the decision because I long to get back to my roots, designing tools specifically for humans to be more productive. I wanted to get back to giving people superpowers. But this time, instead of focusing on creative tooling like at Adobe, I wanted to focus on people's working lives in general. So for those who aren't familiar with Slack, it's a tool that makes it easier for people to communicate, collaborate, and coordinate their work, whatever job needs to be done, big or small, for whatever team that needs to do it, be it a small startup or companies as large as IBM. So that's been my journey designing software tools for different sets of people, for different needs, across a wide range of contexts, learning about how those tools influence the way people create, learn, play, socialize, and work. And this has only been over the last 20 years. So with that in mind, let's take a bigger step back and look at how technology and humanity have evolved historically. Interestingly, we will see that while the impact of technology on humanity remains relatively constant, the rate of technological evolution in recent history has been radically increasing. 
And this, in turn, has created more radical changes in the ways that we work. Technology and tools, human-made objects, extend and amplify our grasp of the world. The way humans make and use tools and how those tools impact our development is perhaps what sets our species apart more than anything else. So let's take a look at a brief history of how tools and humans have evolved together. So what was the first human tool? We can't be sure, but we do know that from around two and a half million years ago, our distant ancestors began to use found objects in a deliberate manner. Harder sharp stones for breaking open shells or protection, sticks for reaching distant food, plants or animal parts for shelter and camouflage. These first types of tools had a revolutionary impact on early humans. Our ability to harness objects gave us primitive superpowers. Much later, about one to two million years ago, early humans discovered fire. We learned to harness fire as a tool of our natural environment. And as a result, humans could cook meat and keep creatures at bay. Again, primitive superpowers. And with that, humanity was off to the races. So again, we, what we see here is a rate of technological progression that is basically accelerating over time. Those first two innovations, stone tools and fire, were separated by millions of years. Then we used our stone tools to hollow out trees to make boats, and we used fire to experiment with heating different things. We heated dirt and clay for bricks and pottery. We heated sand, which made glass. We experimented with chemicals. We developed telescopes and microscopes. We used our tools to more deeply explore the inner workings of our world and our universe. We harnessed the power of physics and nature. And each one of these new tools we created, we combined with other tools to create new technical breakthroughs over and over and over again at a faster and faster pace. Another way to look at the evolution of technology and our tools is less as a linear time frame and more as an abstract evolutionary tree. Let's take, for example, tool one and two, tool two. Historically, humans have combined these tools together to create new technologies, tool three. We typically call this combining two tools or ideas together into something new and innovation. Now, what's interesting about this pace of technological advancement is that it builds on itself. Again, humans are unique in that we build tools from tools. We combine existing ideas, concepts, designs, and solutions together to solve new and unique problems. So now tool one, two, and three can be combined in unique, unique ways to create tools four and five, and the process repeats itself. But now we have more tools and more ideas to build from. So tool seven emerges from an innovation leveraging tool three, four, and six. And the more tools we have, the faster the pace of combination and the faster the pace of innovation. Additionally, there have been certain innovations that in and of themselves or when combined with each other have had such a massive impact on society that they radically speed the pace of technological evolution. One example of this is Gutenberg's printing press. Gutenberg didn't invent paper, the press, or type. Instead, he used his knowledge of metallurgy and combined that with existing technologies to create this radical new design. This design, in turn, facilitated the widespread of information in printed form that resulted in more people sharing more ideas that in turn led to an increased pace of technological recombination and evolution. Let's take a look at a few other massive advances in technology and their impact on humanity. These will be specifically digital technologies. Here's the ENIAC computer. It was the first general purpose digital computer that was able to solve a wide class of large numerical problems through reprogramming. The three women you see here are actually called computers and they're able to plug and replug these different wires to compute different things. The ENIAC demonstrated the power of computing and established the first computer architecture, which is still in use in your iPhone, just at a radically smaller size. One other note here, the ENIAC took up three sides of a massive room, and when it was in use, it cranked up the heat in the room to 120 degrees. Now here's the first graphical user interface, circa 1968. It was conceived and developed by Douglas Engelbart as part of his project augmenting the human intellect. Engelbart had a view of how computers could be used that was both 
at odds with the then prevalent views, which saw them as devices principally useful for computation and primarily military computation, and key proponents of the ways in which computers are now used as generic complements or things that augment uh, humans. Engelbart reasoned that the state of our current technology controls our ability to manipulate information. And that fact, in turn, will control our ability to develop new, improved technologies. He thus set himself the task of developing computer-based technologies for manipulating information directly and also to improve individual and group processes for thinking and knowledge. The impact of this line of thinking is profound. The access to computing as a tool for normal humans to extend their capabilities has led to, well, almost everything that you are interfacing today as you view this presentation. This tool is the interface message processor. It's the first router that moved packets of data between a network of computers, thus ushering in the internet. The impact of the internet as a tool of technology just seems silly to describe. It's as revolutionary as Gutenberg's press in terms of its ability to distribute information across the world, perhaps even more so. Without the internet, there's obviously no Google, no Facebook, or no Zoom, no data transfer without powerful computers and across powerful computers. And this is the Aloha Net, the first experiments in wireless transfer of information packets. It became operational in 1971 and was first used to coordinate computer time sharing between a central computer in Oahu and computers distributed across the Hawaiian Islands. This led to the further development of wireless networks and Wi-Fi, which in turn enabled things like SMS and early net internet access on BlackBerry phones. Now, what's fascinating is that when you take all of these innovations, shrink them down, put them together with one another and another innovations in mass production, battery power, and even in the way that computers are marketed to consumers, which Apple developed, you have something as revolutionary as the iPhone. The iPhone represented a radical shift to a fully featured and fully functional computer, always connected to the internet and streaming data wirelessly in the palm of your hand. And that was only 13 years ago. Since then, these mobile computers have become increasingly powerful and cheaper. Indeed, mobile phones and the wireless networks that deliver them, them data are the only means by which much of the world accesses their digital tools, communicates, or accesses information. If you want proof of how rapidly technology is accelerating, look no further than Moore's Law. What is Moore's Law? It's the observation that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit, that's the thing that mainly powers a computer, doubles about every two years. Moore's Law isn't a law of physics but it's more of an observation on the pace of technological innovation. But it has proven to be true. It's this pace of innovation that has led us from the massive ENIAC computer, the three sides across the wall and 120 degrees of, of ambient temperature, becoming radically more powerful and more dense over the last 50 years, culminating in things such as the iPhone. And the last point I'll make about the, the rate of technological impact on society increasing is that until very recently, tech was exciting but pretty small and didn't really touch most people's lives very much. Back in the 1980s, almost no one in the world was a computer user. 20 years later, we had the dot-com bubble. Facebook was invented 16 years ago, but it's really been over the last 10 years that digital technology has suddenly become systematically important to global society, democracy, and our ways of working without us quite noticing until it had happened. Now, it happened. 97% <laughs> of the world's population has access to the internet via wireless communication. Think about that. 97% of the world's population has access to the internet via wireless communication. However, only half of the world is using the internet. The barrier to full internet access for every human on earth is no longer technology, it's the price of data plans and the smartphone itself, but it's possible. The things that really spike understanding of the impact of technology on our society isn't the progress of wireless technology or even the phone in our pocket. You know, Most of those things are transparent to most people. It's events that impact our lives directly, things like politics or global health emergencies. 
For example, even though Bill Gates was on the cover of every magazine in the early 1990s, your average human didn't pay much attention to the impact of technology on their everyday lives. People unwittingly provided Facebook with highly personal data feeding engagement seeking algorithms that were taught to create political echo chambers filled with opinion, conspiracy theories, and occasionally facts provided by disingenuous actors posing as genuine news authorities. In the 2016 U.S. election, this all combined to stoke a state of political polarization. In fact, many people believe, in fact, people who lead Facebook believe that Donald Trump won in 2016 because he ran a far better digital ad campaign on Facebook versus Hillary Clinton. In other words, Donald Trump's campaign utilized Facebook's tools far better than his competitor, and he won. So now more people understand the deep impact digital technology can have on society. The impact is real, unpredictable, and it's not always positive. But for the sake of this talk, we'll divert our focus away from the political and towards the impact of COVID-19 on the world's population. Specifically, we'll take a look at how our worldwide movement to shelter in place has accelerated technology's impact on the way that we work. As I'm sure you're all aware, now that much of the world's workforce is working remotely, we've seen a massive uptick in the adoption of software tools as more people are turning to them in the absence of an office. Indeed, work across the world has seen a massive shift from people co-located in offices to working remotely. In the US, we've seen companies large and small across all industries establish remote working policies. The new reality is that more people will work away from a central office, physically separated from their colleagues. This is where a whole new set of tools have emerged to help people come together to collaborate, share ideas, make decisions, get aligned, and develop their corporate cultures. As someone who works at a company in the center of this, Slack, I'm obviously very interested in it. Let's take a look at some of the impact, both positive and negative, these new tools have on our working lives. Let's start by examining meetings. In many companies, meetings are the primary means for people to come together face-to-face -face and in real time to explore ideas, make decisions, align on directions, and coordinate their relationships. Pre-COVID, in a world where people came into the office, meetings typically occurred in specialized meeting rooms, the design of which supported certain activities. In this photo, for example, there's a spacious table that facilitates a roomy discussion about an architectural model, and there's ample seating for folks. However, in the heat of conversation, some people have chosen to stand to get a better view of the object they're debating. This room provides all the space to do that. And this seems fairly obvious, but it's important to highlight all the different aspects of this room, the physical space, in comparison to the experience of remote working that we mostly exist in now. Because today, now the primary means of meeting is through video conferencing. Instead of multiple people in the same physical space, the new way of meeting is inverted to multiple people meeting in the same virtual space, physically occupying unique physical spaces. Further, video conferencing as a tool fundamentally shifts the way that we interact with each other. While we still communicate face-to-face -face and in real time, importantly, the fidelity of our communication is significantly compromised. Let's see some examples of this in action. This is the user interface of Zoom video. Y'all have probably used this. It's become massively popular. What makes it so popular is that Zoom makes it easy for many people to gather with just one link. Zoom, like other video conferencing tools, have made it, has made it possible for us to work remotely, but at a human cost. So Zoom, like all video conferencing system, causes deep fatigue when used repeatedly. The reasons why are fascinating. First, being on a video chat just requires more energy and attention than being face to face. The lower fidelity of video means we need to work harder to process verbal and nonverbal cues like facial expressions, the tone and pitch of voice, and body language. For example, look at this grid of people. Focusing on each face, the nuanced expressions and reactions, this is a qualitatively different experience than sitting in a physical room with the same set of people where fidelity is much clearer. The second reason video conferencing can be exhausting is silence. In normal conversation, there are purposeful gaps that are the core to the natural rhythm of our conversation. But in video calls, the delays, whether caused by the system or authentically human delays, make people uncomfortable and anxious. People often ask, is it the technology or is it me? The third reason video conferencing is exhausting is that with all the focus on the face, you're being watched at all times. In order to demonstrate that you are listening, you need to stare intently into a screen. 
In real life, who sits three feet away from other meeting attendees staring directly into their eyes at all times? Without visual breaks to look out the window, we all naturally become more fatigued. You know, of the three reasons Zoom exhausts us as humans, the most important limitation is the loss of nuance and body language. While there have been a number of studies on the complex topic of nonverbal communication, most experts agree that 90 to 70 to 93% of all communication is nonverbal. That majority share being made of tone and visual cues. But video conferencing dulls our human senses. When assessing someone's physical cues, we can notice things like raised eyebrows signaling discomfort, eye contact demonstrating interest. But if someone looks in your eyes too long, they may be lying. Mirroring body language means the conversation is going well. I mean, how do you even mirror over Zoom? And then there are the larger signals like expansive authoritative postures like this one and typic that typically demonstrate leadership. Um, and, and they just look strange in the sea of faces. And so this is me showing a bunch of different strange poses. In any case, so there's millions of years of body language and we throw that all out the window. So I, how do we even cope? So a related point is around participation. Often in physical face-to-face -face meetings, the extroverts dominate the conversation when the introverts stand back. But over video conferencing, the playing field is made a bit more level. People who typically feel more hesitant to speak up often have a better opportunity to make their voices heard. An interesting idea is to design for us to track participation. So one idea is to highlight in the meeting windows the number of times somebody has spoken, like this green highlight, or the percentage of the conversation by each participant. In this regard, technology could truly augment the human interaction by providing a measure of additional information that overlays uh, the experience and that wouldn't be otherwise directly accessible. At the end of the meeting, you'd see a diagram of how much each individual has participated and how. So the next area we'll observe is focused on how we collaborate with each other over purely digital and remote means. Once the meeting is over, the real work starts in a physical office environment. It's in between meetings where people see each other in the halls, informally socializing or sharing information. It's also where people make time at their desks to do focused work. Often in physical spaces, people sit right next to each other and their peers, so they're able to simply look up and chat to get a question answered quickly. However, when people work remotely, there is no hallway or co-located desks where they can informally collaborate or socialize. There is no water cooler. Let's look at how digital tools can be used to help foster better collaboration when people work remotely. So this is Slack. It's the tool that I work on. People increasingly use tools like Slack to share information about projects, align with each other quickly when plans change, and socialize about work, life, and everything in between. As you can see in this conversation, Slack provides a place where conversations happen in real time, like in a real world conversation, but where the history of the conversation is recorded for all people to share across the team. While Slack is great for all of this, an area where it falls short is providing a greater sense of co-presence. At Slack, we think about how Slack might be used uh, use technology to enhance the feeling of people working next to you, even when you are alone. For example, we're thinking about ways we might make it easier to sense who is in the same channel with you at the same time. You only get this impression when several people are, are typing simultaneously, but we think we can do more. On the creative front, for those of you who aren't familiar with Figma, it's a tool that enables multiple people to easily collaborate on the same creative document. It's like Photoshop, but each file you create has its own web page that anybody can access. But the big innovation in Figma is that all changes occur in real time. It allows multiple people simultaneously to work on the same document, the same ever expanding document. So here I'm collaborating with a friend of mine named Kyle. This makes it feel like designers are all working in one big virtual room. As you can see in this video, I'm editing the document, the same document at the same time as a colleague. This obviously gives me a sense of his presence. I can see his thought process, his design experimentation occurring in real time. It's, it's rather intimate, actually. I've actually had experiences where I've dropped into people who don't know that I'm actually in their documents and I'm able to see them do design and edit designs. Um, and I feel like I'm uh, essentially spying on them. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Um, but at the same time, when done publicly, it's very nice. Interestingly, Figma's core model as a real-time collaboration tool has enabled it to flex beyond just design use cases. For example, many remote teams now use Figma as their primary tool to do virtual whiteboarding and run brainstorming sessions. For example, here's a group of people rearranging virtual sticky notes, just like one might do in a real world brainstorm session. That, this is the ultimate frontier in co-presence, which is uh, AR and VR. So Facebook and Microsoft, for example, are heavily investing in, in VR and AR within the context of work and play. 
Um, but, and this is a really big but, we've been talking about the future possibility and wonders of VR for years. You would think that with remote work taking off, VR would finally find its use case, but it hasn't yet, not even with this pandemic. And I think the reason is that VR isn't tuned to humans. People just don't want to wear sweaty headgear all day, at least for now. But this is likely to change and evolve as we move forward, and people adjust to new and novel technologies that connect them in their home alone, to the community at work, but in an altogether new and virtual space. But in any case, I sure hope we do not end up like this, um, but, but I digress. So let's get back to the topic in hand by exploring the last category of work, which is culture. So what defines culture? What creates culture? In its essence, culture is the value shared by a set of people coupled with rituals that reinforce the values via behavior. Culture, it seems, is the most human-centered of concepts. So how does digital technology facilitate culture in an entirely remote world? Well, getting back to Slack, I've found it to be a tool that, if anything, helps accentuate a team's culture. The reasons for, for this is that people use Slack for far more than work. They often use it to banter, bicker, congratulate, and commune. Here's one example of how Slack works to reinforce culture. In Slack, it's easy to create bots that do different tasks automatically. It's common at Slack for teams to create bots that remind them to check in with each other, share something they're grateful for. This ritual is automated. It requires no additional human input uh, to persist other than the group decision to participate. In this regard, Slack creates the container in which culture can thrive, but it's up to the members of the team to then fill that container. See, in this conversation, one person is saying happy birthday to a coworker. Another thing to notice here is the use of emojis uh, in the message. And below that, there are these things that we call reactions. They're basically emoji reactions. Um, and we call these reactions in Slack. These, these icons, uh, the emojis and reactions, are a modern day hieroglyphic. They allow us to communicate in a very small symbol, a sense of spirit. The emojis we use at work also become a part of our culture. Teams often upload their own emojis to equip employees with a set of symbols that trigger a deeper level of meaning, a deeper level of meaning um, in an instant. In fact, this is Slack's in-house custom emoji set. We have thousands of emojis that are related to in-jokes, um, in-stories, company events. These are all symbols that mark that mark and make Slack's history and culture. You know, I find this to be utterly fascinating. I mean, this is a uh, massively scrolling set of um, Slack's culture, you know, events that have occurred at Slack, people who have worked at Slack, all compressed down into a little grid that's about 24 by 24 pixels wide. Um, and I, I just find this utterly fascinating way to express culture. So let's take a look at the next message in this conversation. This one is from Pedro, and he's telling the team that he's thankful for being on it and people have reacted. And in the next message, Ruth thanks Anna for everything that she does for her, the customer support team, and for Slack customers. Now, what I find most fascinating about how Slack facilitates gratitudes is that if the messaging team, which is the one who's doing these gratitudes, were to do this in real life, it might make some folks feel a bit uncomfortable. You know, often in a work context, people feel shy or raw when they express thanks to each other. Not everybody is willing to speak up. But via Slack, where people are already in deep discourse, communicating gratitude can seem more natural and easier, at least for some. OK, so we've now seen how digital tools have enabled people across the world to re work remotely and how our state of remote work has resulted in a radical uptick, to uptick in this usage of these tools as a replacement for the analog in-person work environment. We've also seen how people both shape our tools and are shaped by them. So what's next? What might we do to encourage a more humanistic evolution of our digital tools for work? This is so important, considering that remote working is likely to become the new normal way of working. So here are a few ideas for how we might move forward. First, we can increase the fidelity of interaction to improve communication. This will lead to a greater nuance and body language, which will improve the quality of our communication while reducing fatigue. And we can do this by increasing the bandwidth of our connections. So the higher our bandwidth speeds, uh, there is literally more data pumping through the internet faster, which means our picture is clearer. And this sounds a little bit technical, and it is, but you know, if you look at somebody with your eyes in the real world, that is like as good a bandwidth as you possibly can have. And the only thing that's blocking that level of bandwidth is um, essentially the fiber and the wireless connections that we have. 
And there's also camera improvements, right? So the camera that typically people use on their laptop tops today are extremely low resolution. They're nowhere near as good as our eyeballs. Um, the camera on your iPhones are far better. But I think we can expect that the next generation of laptops will build on some awesome cameras that do magical things that will help us see and feel each other better. Now, you can kind of even take this one step further and imagine cameras that can sense heartbeat or cameras that can sense body temperature. And there are some ideas around how to bring that information out to the fore that goes beyond just what you see at the face. It's really what's going on inside the body. That could be really interesting as well. So lastly, I like to see more innovations that actually accentuate body language. I mean, imagine if your video conferencing apps, when, uh, when you physically raised your hand, could see that, acknowledge that, and then overlay your screen with an emoji of a raised hand or make it that a bit more obvious. This could be a simple but powerful way for technology to augment our natural human interaction. The second big idea is to improve our interface inputs beyond the keyboard and mouse. So for example, what if everybody were able to use a digital tablet and pencils as a second screen to express their ideas more fluidly via writing or diagramming, just like you might whiteboard using a pen? Or getting back to that video conferencing idea of recognizing your hands, what if there were more hand recognition across all of your workflows? So for example, what if our computers sensed our body language even when we're alone? If after a stressful meeting, I put my head in my hands like that, perhaps my computer can recommend that I take a break or at least ask how I'm doing. Or maybe my robot makes me a drink. Lastly, when working from home, voice input becomes easier. So in a relatively solo and private environment, it's easier for me to talk or listen to my computer versus in a crowded office where I look like a lunatic. I personally love to start my day having my Slack messages read to me and my most important messages read to me and then the ability to respond to those messages with my voice um, without the stress of my keyboard. I'd love to do this while taking a walk. Um, so that would be really amazing. It would help me feel more like a human while also being productive. Okay, the next idea is for computers to generate insightful feedback loops on the work that we do. So for example, getting back to the idea I presented earlier about that tracker that would focus on meeting participation, this could be a call to, this could be applied to meeting calls, um, to the usage of design files like Figma, to like code that people write. Now, this idea could be a bit scary because time participating doesn't necessarily equate to quality of participation, but I think it's useful for us to pull a bit on this thread. So next, our computers should be aware of the data created by the entire company. So for example, in a world where we're working remotely, the only way to communicate organizational changes are via Slack or email or other digital tools. So how can we be sure that everybody has the update? Being able to track who has read what could be useful to ensure that message has landed. And there's a whole realm of other types of insights we can provide organizations based on the data that they generate. Lastly, I'd love to understand my level of personal productivity. My iPhone tells me how many hours and minutes I've used my phone. That's really convenient for me. Slack or Zoom should tell me how many hours I've been in front of my laptop. I want to know this information in order to manage and control my own engagement with digital tools and ideally reduce that engagement or at least be more considerate about it. Okay, so we've talked about, we, we traveled across time to review the evolution of tools in society, and we've landed in the present day where our digital tools have made remote work possible. But at what cost? We interface with screens and keyboards all day long, and we long for the stimulation provided by interpersonal human-to-human -human interaction and the physical interaction of the office space. And this tense dance continues. The one thing we can be sure of is that technology will continue to influence our behaviors as humans, and we will, in turn, harness technology to create new tools for new purposes at an ever-quickening rate. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Plenty for us to, uh, to digest and to think through, and you've taken us through a whirlwind tour of technology and its changes. So, as is always the case, I've now got far more many questions than I can ask you. We don't have enough time for that, so my job is to try and do the best to get through some of them. So let's start really simply. When you've had a career like you have, working at the organizations that you have, what took you to Slack in the first place? Oh, well, let's see. I mean, what, I, um, you know, I've obviously worked across a range of companies, and as I mentioned, I'm, you know, I wanted to get back into a, um, 
you know, a world where I was able to give people superpowers via technology. And so that really meant working on a tool that, um, that did that. And Slack's mission is to make people's working lives more um, simple, more productive, and ideally more pleasant. And, you know, I, from my perspective, if I'm going to be spending my time doing something, uh, you know, eight hours a day um, or more, I want to make sure that the thing that I'm doing is, is actually good for society. And if Slack is able to attain its mission, then um, it means that we're giving people time back and there's nothing more valuable than time. And so if we can give people time back, hopefully when they get that time back, uh, they're then able to use that time to get back to you know, what it means to be more human. Um, you know, but everybody's got a different way of using their time. But if, if, if like I can contribute to help giving people back 30 minutes a day, that's huge. You know, if you're able to do your work more efficiently and have 30 minutes a day that you can spend with your family or doing a hobby or, exercising or taking a walk or meditating. I mean, these are all, you know, or protesting, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, these are all important, you know, important things that you're doing outside of the context of your work. Yes, right. So, so using your language of superpower, because ironically, possibly the biggest superpower that the world's craving for now is the fundamental right to be heard. So what role do technology companies play in, in, in allowing that diversity of thinking? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I do. I, I, it's interesting to sort of like, you know, people want to be heard, but I think even more so there's a level of inequality within the world today that is, um, you know, it is, it's, it, it's not right. And so, yes, people want to be heard, but I think more than anything, what's important is that uh, action is taking is taken because um, if action isn't taken, nothing changes. And so, um, you know, people need to be heard. People's voices need to be amplified. Uh, people who are in power need to feel uncomfortable. And when that happens, then they learn and they understand the perspectives of others and then things change. So, um, Yes, I think that, you know, everybody wants to be heard and different voices can be amplified. Um, and technology obviously is definitely amplifying different voices, but what ultimately needs to come of the worldwide protests and this focus um, is, is real change and real action. Um, and that requires people to um, listen. And listening is the most important part of that. Um, one thing that I have, uh, though, experienced, which I've found to be... Um, very impactful for me, at least, is uh, on Twitter, I now follow many people who are um, black, who I didn't follow before. And so my Twitter feed three weeks ago was, you know, it, it was um, mainly focused on uh, the communities of uh, sort of design. And I followed some artists and some photographers, and then some, you know, some people who I thought had interesting ideas about technology. And um, now my, my Twitter um, feed is populated with um, a lot of black voices from across the United States. And for me, it has been absolutely influential in impacting the way that I am. It's basically like I now have 20 minutes or 30 minutes usually per day of, a, like, of, of reading through, through Twitter. That's one of the main ways that I, I get my news and, and understanding of uh, you know, the world to a certain degree. And now that's 30 minutes of voices that weren't um, impacting me and influencing me, sometimes making me feel uncomfortable, but, but ultimately helping me learn uh, perspectives that are my own. And so those voices are now being heard and I'm listening. And so I, I think that's, you know, that's an important, incredible thing that technology can do. Indeed. So th that's a fascinating point. And, and so to pick up on that slightly further, how do you design, how in your role, do you design the anatomy of a team or the rhythm on how a team works to ensure you have this diversity of thought? Because you've got multiple generations, you've got multiple cultures, you've got multiple types of industries all using your platform. So inside your business, what, what does that look like? How do you encourage that? Yeah, I mean, so there, there is, 
you know, I think Slack is a great company in terms of um, empowering people to ensure their voices are heard via the way that uh, the technology itself fundamentally works. Um, almost every conversation that we have within Slack is within public channels. Uh, so anybody can join the channels where we're having conversations about the way that products are developed. There is a significant amount of feedback from everybody at the company on anything that we're working on. Now, of course, there are private channels that um, some de like some decisions are made in, uh, and you know those are typically around like, for example, planning our remote working policy. That's not necessarily a conversation. The planning part isn't a conversation that the entire company needs to have in real time, even though feedback from the entire company is able to inform that planning process. But when the actual decisions around how we might change a remote working policy uh, come out, everybody will be a part of the conversation and can contribute to evolving it forward. So whether it's the way that we work within Slack or whether it's the products that we're developing at Slack and the features that we're developing at Slack, Slack as a tool has helped us um, encourage a, you know, a, a, the voices across the company. Now, um, the other side of this is ensuring that at Slack, Slack is the best it creates a culture that um, everybody feels comfortable and supported within. And I think that's an important thing for us as a company to continue to work at. Um, because in order to have a diversity of perspectives that inform what we are building, uh, that represents the diversity of the, the real world, we have to make sure that we have um, people at the company who represent the real world. We have to have more black employees, more Latinx employees, um, and in order for that to happen, we have to have a environment within the context of Slack that is um, supportive as much as it possibly can be. And we can never you know, stop working on that. Um, so that's, that's the way I, I look at it. You have, a, you, know, you have a company sort of the members of your, your organization and their diverse perspectives. And it's a never ending quest to make sure that you have an increasingly diverse population within your company. And then you need to make sure that your company's environment, its culture supports people's perspectives so that people feel empowered and comfortable and safe within the context of your company and that their voices are heard and that they're influencing everybody else's voices uh, or everybody else's perspectives. And then it's important to have the type of communication and tools within a company so that um, people's perspectives are quite easily shared and in a transparent way as quickly as possible. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. In your talk, you showed us two very different worlds, probably both we could relate to. One is the traditional office setting, and then the second is in our pajamas with a hot dog on a, on a call. You're an organization that will be thinking far more about the future of work than most of us. How do you see it playing out? Are we going to be remote more often? Are we going to be remote first? What, give us a sense of what you think it looks like in five years' time. So it's, you know, it's a, one thing I've learned about trying to predict the future is that, you know, you're always going to be wrong. There's no real, like, I, I, I'm excited about thinking about the future. Um, in my career, I have um, realized that the best use of energy is to focus on things that are within your power that can um, uh, actually come to light and to life over the next three to six months, maybe even over the next year. But when I like thinking about five years into the future, let's cycle back 2015. Did we have any idea where we'd be in 2020? I think that's, you know, probably not. Uh, maybe there are some things that came to pass. Maybe things didn't happen as quickly as we thought they would. In any case, um, I try not to predict the future too much, but where I do think things are headed, and this is less about five years from now, I think we're going to see these changes over the next, you know, six months or a year. Um, I think even when there's a vaccine, even when people can all come back to their offices as they were before COVID, we will have a environment where more companies, more large companies, uh, influential companies that employ, you know, hundreds of thousands of people across the world will have more liberal remote working policies. And that will influence than every other company to have remote working policies where we can, where we can do it. Um, and as a result, I think we're going to have a blended environment. I think we're going to have much more, many more people working remotely, and we'll still have physical offices, 
Um, you'll have some companies that are entirely remote. We'll have more of those. Um, but I think we'll see more of this, this sort of hybrid blend where we might have smaller office spaces. The office spaces themselves might be less about people coming to work at desks and more about people coming together to commune or to align or brainstorm um, or to have a sense of camaraderie. Um, and we may experience people not working um, the entire week in the office. We might have people who come in for two or three days and then work two or three days from home. So I think we'll see this blend. Um, and I, my hope is that our office spaces, the actual physical office spaces in our, in our built environment um, are sort of they evolve as well to facilitate uh, different types of, of interactions. And then at the home, I think that's also a really interesting opportunity. So if more people are working remotely, I think it's as interesting to think about what kind of tools and technologies and physical environments can best facilitate um, you know, people working remotely uh, in, their, in their own homes. Um, I mean, as I, as I mentioned, I think voice is really interesting within the context of a sort of solo work environment. I think it's very interesting. I think, you know, even, you know, an AR or VR technology, I would probably appreciate more AR, like something like, uh, you know, if Apple develops a set of glasses, they'll probably be pretty good. <laughs> they'll probably look pretty good and I probably wouldn't mind wearing them and they'll probably be very ergonomic. Um, and so, you know, the, the idea of sort of augmenting our abilities at home, I think um, will feel a bit more natural because we won't have this environment of others around us, you know, uh, being disturbed by us engaging with our technologies via voice or, you know, tapping in the air that won't feel as funny. Um, so I think there's some really interesting opportunities to think about at home as well. Right. So as you, as you from, from your view and your insight as to how Slack's being used in different communities, is it radically different how it's used in one country versus used in another country or genders or age groups? You know, it's, I, that's, um, uh, it is. I mean, it is entirely differently used by different uh, teams. And it's, it's used differently by different teams, but the, the sort of the fundamentals of Slack is the same across the board. But, you know, Slack as a company supports teams that are, you know, five people um, who are all working remotely and they may not all be the same age. And we support companies like IBM that has hundreds of thousands of people working worldwide. And, you know, we have uh, teams in Japan that are using Slack in a certain way. And it's really more associated with the type of business um, and some of the cultural aspects of the company uh, than anything else. Again, the core way that Slack works, it's a, a messaging experience. People are able to send each other messages. There is the ability to integrate um, uh, sort of bots or capabilities from other applications like Google Drive and Google Docs into Slack. And then that becomes uh, sort of a part of the messaging thread as well. Um, these core sort of, um, these core capabilities that Slack has that allow people to collaborate more efficiently and align more efficiently, um, and using the channel as a space to do your work and to take projects and focus on them with groups of people. That's a universal capability, but there's many different ways that it's used. Again, depending on geography, the, the location, the company's culture. Yeah. I mean, we have people in agriculture who use Slack. We have people who at Pixar use Slack. And it's a different sort of world between those two, um, those two spheres. You know, we have people who use Slack just to monitor the builds of their animation or monitor the builds of the software that they're developing. And we have other integrations with Slack where if you come through a door in your physical environment, it'll send a notification to Slack that then ping somebody in the security office so they can see that somebody's entered into their office, but they're seeing that in Slack. So, so many different use cases um, mm. that Slack can be terraformed to make um, possible. And so, is there a, one of the questions that comes up quite a bit, is there a tension between optimizing the platform based on how it's being used without being seen to listen into conversations to understand what's trending? How do you manage the privacy between those two points? There's no real tension. I mean, we, we, um, 
you know, Slack, when, when, when companies use Slack, it's their data, they own the data. Um, you know, we are not, uh, you know, searching through their data, this, you know, and trying to make meaning from it. Now, I, I think they're, uh, you know, I, working at Google, for example, um, you know, there's a lot of power in understanding what everybody's query is across the world. I mean, there's like, uh, you know, I'm not a uh, machine learning architect, um, but think about every query that goes into Google, all those queries. What is Google learning from all those queries, right? Think about uh, all of the documents that people have authored in Google Docs. And, um, you know, you can come up with some very powerful tools based on this massive corpus of data. I mean, we have things like Google Translate. The autocomplete in Google search is incredible. It understands <laughs> what you're saying when you type in a bunch of gibberish, it can convert that to a meaningful query. And it's incredibly convenient, you know, especially when I'm on my fat fingered, you know, I, you know, my iPhone, oftentimes I've got a bunch of periods of my queries and it just figures out what I'm trying to ask and it gives me the answer. So there are, you know, massive conveniences. I think, you know, for me, ethics is really important when we think about how we're utilizing data in different ways. And, you know, part of ethics is making sure that we have very clear policies for how we use data. And then the flip side of it is, you know, how are we actually using the data and, and what is the, um, you know, what is the overarching impact of how we use that data? Fantastic. Uh, you've said in the past that sometimes the best design solution isn't necessarily the best business solution. And as you look at the difference between being more efficient and more productive versus being more and more human, how do you balance those two, not necessarily competing, but two distinct objectives? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, in Slack's mission again is to make people's working lives, you know, more simple, more productive, pleasant, and that's all about efficiency. You know, the more productive part is all about efficiency. Um, and so, I would love, like, my when I when I think about the best uses of technology, um, fundamentally, I, I, I think that much of humanity has has sort of moved away from some of the things that have sort of made us human over time. And we've moved so fast into a new reality where, again, our senses are dulled. We're not, um, you know, we don't have the notion of, of like crafts people um, and people who are, you know, really focused on um, the output of your human productivity is it just really has dissolved over time and actually that actually started with the Bauhaus movement and, and sort of like industrialization and mass production of objects um which again it was a technological revolution in that regard but you know it's interesting just like how much we would you know we feel like it, we would want to pay for you know bespoke one-off objects that people make um, and I think it's really harkening back to the fact that like everything is so mass produced now, you know, nothing is truly sort of authentic and tangible that, um, you know, I would like to see more people have more time to be more human. Um, and then on the other side, there's this, you know, this more global challenge that we have as a society where uh, we are rapidly hitting the point where our earth is less inhabitable and it may soon at some point be, you know, uninhabitable. And, you know, so there's a you know, the efficiency comes into part of that, but but that's less a conversation of you know is this efficiency versus our you know slowing down in our humanity. This is really are we as a society investing in our our efforts in the right types of technologies um, that are solving the most important problems that we have, and so you can create efficiencies in certain areas that really don't matter in the whole big scheme of things. And that's a much bigger sort of challenge. It's, you know, there, it, that gets down to who's making the calls around how we're, you know, how we're, how we're spending our time and energy and resources. Is it, you know, the, the government of, of Tuvalu whose island is literally sinking and it may not be here in a few years? Or is it, you know, the um, shareholders and CEOs of uh, these massive, you know, organizations that are, um, you know, earning a ton of money and that are paying for lobbyists that are then influencing politicians to um, continue down this path where we're not necessarily investing as much in sustainable technology worldwide. So um, it's a very like, big, big, broad answer, but, um, you know, that's kind of the, 
the important way of thinking is like, what are the what are the next order consequences for the the things that we're doing today and for the technical innovations that we create? And are we investing our time in the right things within the world? Um, and do we have the right sort of structures in place to make sure that, at least from my perspective, what I value is, you know, people being able to express themselves in a more humanistic manner, A, and then the sustained um, existence of human life on earth. <laughs> like those, gotcha. those are two really important things for me. And so that's, that's kind of my orientation when I, when I think about the answer to this question. Yeah, Sup superbly answered. And now we're at our final question, which I'm going to make a, a very simple frame. If you were to give emerging designers or UX practitioners or those looking to future-proof themselves into the future, what's the one superpower they should cultivate or muscle they should build thinking about the world we're now going to be operating in? Well, the answer to this is an answer that I would give I think it's a relatively timeless answer. It um, transcends sort of like, you know, the current state of the world, future state of the world. It's a very simple answer. Um, I'm sure many people have heard it before, but the, um, the, what I would say is for everybody, for people who are start, starting out and even people who have, you know, been doing this for 20 years, like me, maintain your sense of curiosity, humility, and um, never cease learning. Um, and never cease putting yourself in positions that are challenging you. And uh, if you can do that and successfully orient yourself on that next opportunity to learn, um, where you're provided the opportunity, you have the right context that you're that you're working within or learning within, um, and then you're dedicating yourself towards the actual act of learning, and you're sort of prioritizing the, you know, the challenge and the growth from the challenge. Um, and you really are energized by that, uh, then you know what that will do is it will ensure that you're able to grow over time and you're able to do new and more interesting things successively and sequentially. Um, it gives you a better shot of being able to do that than really anything else. Um, so that's, that's the main advice that I would um, provide for folks. It's very basic, but it's, I think, evergreen advice. Thank you, Ethan for your time this morning and the generosity and the honesty of the answers that you've given us. We would really appreciate, if you could, taking the time to give us any feedback out of today. What did you like? What could we do better? And you'll see that on the, the particular tab that's within the app that you're on. You'll also see there that we have our next event for, uh, for the series, which is on July the 23rd. And this time, the keynote speaker is someone quite different. It's Kelly McCarthy. Kelly is the Senior Vice President of Global Brands at Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, but with the same sort of brief, those prepared to be speaking out loud to answer the difficult questions and to share their perspective of the journey we're all on. So once again, our sincere thanks this morning to Ethan and to every one of you that dialed in. Have a wonderful day.